Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for joining me for this podcast. So I am recording this introduction uh, at the end. In other words, I just completed working on my video, doing all the edits and all. And as the as this work has gone on for the last couple of days, I put a lot more in it than what I initially thought that I would. So I'm I'm doing the intro here last in a, in a sense. So once the main body of this video picks up here in just a few seconds, you're going to, you're going to go back in time a couple of days. But, um, as I started working on this video, uh, yesterday, Sunday, I discovered that Ed Litton has continued to plagiarize. He plagiarized something, at least one thing that I know of in his sermon, uh, from just yesterday. And this was the day after he started scrubbing the um, Redemption Church's YouTube channel. So there's a lot here, and um, I, there's a lot of theology in here. We're going to talk about the plagiarism. We're going to talk about how uh, the, the dangers of saying that God whispers about certain sins. I'm going to give you the full context of this. I'm going to show you how J.D. Greer took R.C. Sproul out of context, and I'm going to end with the gospel. So there's a lot here. Please do watch it from start to finish. Uh, before you form an opinion, uh, please do watch the whole whole thing. So thank you very much. And so uh, now we are going to go back in time about uh, 48 hours. Here we go. The big news in the evangelical world, broadly speaking, and the SBC world more specifically speaking, is the undeniable plagiarism by the SBC's newly elected president, Ed Litton, who is the pastor of Redemption Church in Mobile, Alabama. Ed Litton plagiarized a sermon by the preceding pastor or president of the SBC, J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer preached a sermon on Romans 1 dealing with homosexuality in January of 2019. And then just about one year later, Ed Litton preached also preached a sermon on Romans 1 uh, that undeniably plagiarized J.D. Greer. And I want us to talk about this. I'll show the clip that proves this uh, beyond any reasonable doubt. I'm going to show you that. You may have already seen it. But uh, yes, as of this recording, uh, J.D. Greer has issued a statement and Ed Litton has issued an apology of sorts. And uh, I want to be fair to these men. I'll show you what they had to say. I'll show you the video proof. I'll show you what they had to say. But we're going to talk about this because uh, this isn't so easily just brushed aside like I see many in the uh, more in the social justice wing of the uh, SBC that, that are really wanting to do. Uh, what I'm seeing thus far from both from J.D. Greer and Ed Litton is not at all uh, satisfactory. So we're going to talk about the plagiarism issues. And we're also going to talk about what I believe is is really the more serious issue and, and has uh, potentially more impact and more poses more of a danger, spiritually speaking. And that is the theology that was presented in these sermons. And uh, so we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, undoubtedly, there will be a lot more developments that are coming. And in fact, my understanding right now, according to what I just have seen just a few minutes ago, um, over 100 of Ed Litton's sermons have now been either removed from the church's YouTube channel or have been set to private. So you you can't see them. The only people who can see them would be the ones that were directly and intentionally given uh, access to them. So uh, as, as I know for a fact, I know for a fact that dozens have been, videos have been removed. I do know that for a fact as of right now. And, and according to a, a report, I just read over a hundred. And there was, I don't know how else to to read that. I don't know what, what else you could read into that uh, for the reason for removing those sermons unless uh, this one sermon that has been getting so much attention is not the only sermon that Ed Litton has plagiarized. Uh, why else remove them? So I'm going to I'm going to show you the video proof, and uh, we'll pick back up after this is over. So 
uh, watch this video and I'm going to put in the in a little description here you should be seeing it right about now if you've already seen it you can fast forward uh, to that minute mark that you see there and um, skip it and pick back up with my comments okay dear ones I need to say this before I show you the video proof of the plagiarism you heard me say just a second ago that I know for a fact that dozens of videos have already been removed from, I think I said, Lytton's YouTube channel. I should have said Redemption Church's YouTube channel, the church that he pastored. And you might have picked up that I said that in such a way that kind of communicated that I, I know a bit more than what I was letting on. And I do. And I've given this some thought. Uh, I, I do know more. I'm in possession of 37 of the sermons that Ed Litton has preached uh, from his Roman series. A friend of mine in Texas uh, sent me um, all of these videos and I don't know who downloaded them but um, it, it wasn't me but uh, he did send them to me and I, and I have them. Uh, I have watched one of them and the only one that I have watched is the sermon in question, the sermon that has generated so much uh, controversy. I have watched that start to finish. I'll talk about the theology of it as we progress in this video. Um, the other 36, I'm not going to watch. I don't have, I have neither the time and quite frankly, nor do I have the interest to go through. I, I think that the plagiarism has been established, as you will see. Uh, but here's the thing. Why would you remove so many videos? In fact, uh, according to something that I was just uh, sent, as of this recording right now, uh, 143 of Ed Litton's videos uh, from the Redemption Church's YouTube channel have either been deleted, privatized, or hidden. 143. Why in the world would you do that unless you know that there is more plagiarism there? Um, I can imagine, I cannot fathom any other explanation other than uh, there's a lot more plagiarism out there uh, to be found from Ed Litton. Now, uh, I, I say that to say this. I'm not going to be the one to find it. As I said, I have neither the time nor the interest to do that. I've got other things to do. Uh, and I don't even know who it actually was who downloaded these videos. I don't know if it was my friend or someone else, but anyway, I, I do have them. But the point of the matter is this, is that if, if this one individual downloaded them, you can be sure that others have downloaded them as well, and probably a lot more than these 37. And even though I'm not going to go comb through all these videos, other people will. I'm not an investigative reporter. Thank goodness, that's not my thing. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. But others will, and um, others, other people have these videos. So, uh, Mr. Greer, Mr. Litton, if you know that there are other plagiaristic shoes to drop, then I, I, it would behoove you to come out and say that now, because it's just a matter of time. It's not going to come from me. It's not going to come from. Um, my direction or anything else. I have no idea who's going to do it, but be sure there are other people. There are people working on it. I have no doubt. So uh, it would behoove you to come out and just be honest about this because the apology from um, you, Mr. Litton, if you're watching this, only dealt with that one sermon. And uh, apparently there's a lot more out there, unfortunately. Okay, so let's go. I'll show you the video proof of the plagiarism and then we're going we're gonna to talk about the integrity issues here. We're going to talk about plagiarism issues. And we're going to talk about the theology, which concerns me even more. Here we go. We'll give you a warning here that this might be the toughest week that we will have in the book of Romans. Romans 1, the end of it, is tied in difficulty only with Romans 5, Romans 9, and Romans 11. This may be one of the toughest passages we face in the book of Romans. This is the steep climb I talked about. So in fact, let's just sort of loosen things up right now. Everybody turn right now to your neighbor, look them in the eyes. If you know them, if you know them, put your hand on their shoulder and say, this is going to be a really tough week for you. Okay. And tell them, say, I'm praying for you. 
to have the faith and humility to receive this word. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now. And I, I want you to say, I know this sermon's going to be really tough for you, but I'm here praying that you will listen and obey whatever God says. Go ahead, do that right now. But y'all, we believe that God's word is good, do we not? You see, we believe that God's word is good. In some of my travels overseas, I'll, I'll go into these temples that are erected to a foreign god. I remember being in one of them um, a, a while ago over in uh, somewhere um, uh, in Asia. And Paul David Tripp is a favorite pastor of mine to read. He's a pastor in Philadelphia. Uh, he was on a mission trip to Nepal. And he went, he was taken by a missionary into a temple. And there was, uh, I go in this temple, it's this gigantic, I mean, beautiful temple. And right in the middle of it is a, about a 25 foot statue of a, a goddess who has multiple breasts and, and multiple arms. And, you- and he said, and I, I will not go into details, but he does explain it, uh, that there was an idol in the center of this temple. He said it was one of the most grotesque things he's ever seen. Watch these worshipers come in and they would prostrate themselves before this statue. And many of them were very emotional. Many had traveled a lot of miles to get uh, to this. Um, very poor, some of them, and taking the little money they had and pouring it out and offering before this statue of this God. And our- but what really turned his stomach wasn't the shape of the idol. It was how people were bowing down to it, kissing it, putting money on it. He met a family that had walked for four months to get to this idol. Later, finding myself just going back over that incident in my mind and, and feeling sorry for the people there and thanking God kind of in my heart that I wasn't, I wasn't like them. But and he walked out of that temple saying, thank God I'm not like them. Then in the middle of that thought, it just occurred to me. I had a whole list of things in my heart that have taken God's place just like that statue had. When the spirit of God said, Paul, You are exactly like them. I I compared it to if the earth were to say to the sun, I am sick and tired of you being in the middle of the solar system. If the earth were to ask the sun in our solar system, I'm sick and tired of floating out here in nothingness, surrounding you constantly. I want to be the center of this solar system. The sun might just say to the earth, all right, have it your way. The earth is 30,000 times smaller than the sun and would not have the ability to keep all the planets in orbit. And so the solar system would begin to unravel simply because the sun gave to the earth what it asked for. Folks, our entire solar system would fall apart. Why? Because the earth doesn't have the power of light and it doesn't have the power of gravitational force to hold this solar system in existence. Sexual disorder, that was the first thing, verses 26 and 27. Now we've got economic disorder. There's economic disorder. Look at verse 29. Social disorder. He says there's social disorder. Social disorder. Just think Facebook. Uh, and that's just on Facebook. Look, uh, then you got spiritual disorder. There's spiritual disorder there. You could think of that as family disorder. You got- and there's family disorder. They disobey their parents. You see, there are three ways I see us really going wrong with this in the church at large. Three- I'll tell you three ways I think we've gone wrong. Number one. And one, we believe that God doesn't really care about this. First one is that we don't think God cares about this issue. We make the gospel message is not let the gay become straight. The gospel message is let the dead become alive. And the gospel message is not let the gay get straight. The gospel message is let the dead come to life. Which leads me to the second way that I see us going wrong here. Number two, we think it's the worst sin. Here's the second thing I think we do, we go wrong at, and that is thinking homosexuality is the worst of all sins. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference, she said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. Throughout Jesus's ministry in his life, we see him demonstrating great, just incredible sympathy for those caught in sexual sin and great animosity toward the religiously proud. Jesus forgave prostitutes, but he was harsh with religious materialists. In fact, Jesus one time, not one time ever said that it was difficult for the same sex attracted to go to heaven. He did say it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, eye of a needle, than it was for a religiously proud or materialistically successful person to enter into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, he said it would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one of these. Only when we grasp, only when we grasp this truth will we become ministers of the gospel. When we understand like Paul did that we are the worst sinner that we know. 
Only then, when you, only when you understand that, will you understand that if Jesus came to die for you, that there's nobody he didn't die for. We can't grasp this gospel till we confess with Paul these words. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance, that Christ has come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Here's the third way that we go wrong. Number three, assuming it's hard for LGBTQ people to get to heaven. Thirdly, we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven. Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. Rosaria Butterfield, whose story I've shared with you before here, she was a practicing lesbian, very outspoken professor of literature and women's studies at Syracuse University. She was a practicing lesbian in a committed lesbian relationship. A culture warrior on the far left. She said it was Romans 1 that brought her to faith in Christ. And then she said, and I quote, homosexuality is not the core of our rebellion against God. A desire to be God is. A desire to be the one who gets to declare good and evil, to play judge rather than be judged. A desire to use God's creation for our own gratification rather than with pleasure for his glory. Undeniable plagiarism. Now, to be fair, after watching that video, you might think the entirety of Ed Litton's sermon was lifted from J.D. Greer's. Uh, that's not the case. I watched the, I watched the entirety of both Greer's and Litton's sermons and there's undeniable plagiarism there, but uh, they weren't exactly alike. Uh, although, after having watched the entirety of both sermons, you could, there could have been more examples of plagiarism cited than, than what we saw in this particular video. So a lot was there, but not the entirety, but really doesn't matter. It's obvious that there is plenty there to qualify as plagiarism. It's not just Lytton's plagiarism, though. It's, it's Greer's plagiarism as well, his uh, plagiarism of Paul Tripp. Now, watch this section again. And when I first saw this, it really raised my eyebrows. Watch this. In some of my travels overseas, I'll, I'll go into these temples that are erected to a foreign god. I remember being in one of them um, a, a while ago over in uh, somewhere um, uh, in Asia. And there was, uh, I go in this temple, it's this gigantic, I mean, beautiful temple. And right in the middle of it is a, about a 25 foot statue of a, a goddess who has multiple breasts and, and multiple arms. Okay, when I first saw this sermon from Greer, that part right there just did not resonate with me at all. It did not at all seem authentic. It, it very much seemed like he was making that up when he said it was somewhere, uh, you know, in, in uh, Asia. Uh, and, and then he does, goes on to describe these um, statues and these idols. And it, it, I just thought when I first saw that, that, that that's not a firsthand experience right there because I'm, I'm familiar myself with the general uh, idea here of these idols. The thing is, is I can remember exactly where I was when I saw these things. I was in India in 2015, and you saw all over India, at least all over the area that we were in in India, Kakanada and other places, uh, you saw these, and see so right there, I can even remember the city. I don't have to, I don't have to go back and think, uh, uh, in Asia, that just didn't resonate with me. I thought that that's not a that's not a first hand memory that he's pulling up there, uh, because I've seen these statues. I mean, they are grotesque. There's a lot of different ones. There's one, the biggest one we saw, like a half half man, half monkey. We Mike Miller and I, who we were in India together, we started calling him Monkey Man. I mean, the, these grotesque statues, and you'd see them uh, various places, and they were they were put up on. Uh, on some platforms with steps walking up to them. People would all walk up these steps and, and they would put offerings of, I don't know that I can remember seeing them put money. Maybe they do, but, um, but they put food. I would see bowls of rice and stuff at the bases of these grotesque statues. And uh, Mike Miller and I would look at each other like, do they not, do they not realize that, uh, you know, monkey man here or whatever statue, you know, with a, eight arms or whatever it's, that statue's not eating the rice that they keep putting up there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I know the general thing of what he's talking about, but I can remember exactly where I was. So, um, but that, 
when I first saw that, I thought that is not a firsthand experience. He's that's not something that he himself is is pulling from. From and then come to find out, sure enough, he's lifting that from Paul Tripp. And uh, now J.D. Greer did address this. So I want to read to you what he put up in his statement, June 25th, Saturday, June 25th. J.D. Greer says. In that particular message, I shared a story with our congregation about a moment of realization I had after visiting pagan temples in Asia that the heartbreaking idolatry we see displayed in those temples is something endemic to the human heart. What starts as bewilderment and even a little disgust at the grotesque displays of idolatry turns into a lament over the condition of the fallen human heart we all possess. The story was inspired by a similar one I read from Paul Tripp sharing his observations as he had visited a temple in northern India. That's where I was. Um, more eastern India. But but as a former missionary to Southeast Asia, I had had the same experience. In fact, almost every missionary I know has had this same moment of revelation. It's a common insight among missionaries on the field, one that is shared often in prayer and support circles. Uh, I felt no hesitation in changing the... Here's the problem. I felt no hesitation in changing the details of the story to match my own experience or no need to cite Paul Tripp as the source as the events I tell them A actually happened to me and B are common among missionaries. I did convey to Ed Litton where I got the inspiration for the story and Ed having never lived in Asia chose to tell the story in Paul's words and attribute it to Paul. Well, a couple things here. Um, a, what you're describing, Mr. Greer, did not actually happen to you by your own admission. You're pulling that from Paul Tripp. But uh, I want to read, unless you think I am being too harsh, I want to read to you an article that was written by D.A. Carson for the Gospel Coalition back in 2010. And uh, now, my citation of this is not an endorsement of the Gospel Coalition. I have grave concerns with the Gospel Coalition and the direction they have been going for a number of years. They're they're fully woke and fully embrace social justice, and uh, now they're exegeting movies. But um, so this is not an endorsement of the Gospel Coalition. I have grave concerns there. But um, D. A. Carson wrote this about plagiarism back in 2010. He says first. Taking over another sermon and preaching it as if it were yours is always and unequivocally wrong. And if you do it, you should resign or be fired immediately. Well, that's what Ed Litton has done. The wickedness is along at least three axes. One, you are stealing. Two, you are deceiving the people to whom you are preaching. More on that in a minute. Number three, perhaps worst, you are not devoting yourself to the study of the Bible to the end that God's truth captures you, molds you, makes you a man of God, and equips you to speak for him. Amen to that. If preaching is God's truth through human personality, so Phillips Brooks, then serving as nothing then serving as nothing more than a kind of organic recording device in playback mode does not qualify. In in Watch this. Incidentally, changing a few words here and there in someone else's work does not let you off the hook. Retelling personal experiences as if they were yours when they were not makes the offense all the uglier. That this offense is easy to commit because of the availability of source material in the digital age does not lessen its wickedness any more than the ready, availab ready availability of porn in the digital age does not turn pornography into a virtue. So, um, 11 years ago now, D.A. Carson spoke specifically to this issue with J.D. Greer's plagiarism of Paul Tripp, saying, uh, retelling personal experiences as if they were yours when they were not makes the offense all the uglier. So J.D. Greer, despite trying to explain himself, nonetheless, um, this is plagiarism, and he should just come out and say, I plagiarized Paul Tripp. Okay, now I want to discuss Ed Litton's plagiarism. On the same day that J.D. Greer released his statement, Saturday, June 26th, I may have said 25th earlier, but it was the 26th, Ed Litton released a statement of his own dealing with this. 
And uh, I have links below in the description if you would like to read the entirety of their respective statements. Of course, you can do that, but just for time's sake, I'm going to read the pertinent parts of this. And so Ed Linton says, we employ a preaching team approach at Redemption Church that is comprised of eight men from our staff slash congregation who meet weekly to discuss study insights, outlines, and approaches to the text. This sermon prep process includes working in the languages, consulting commentaries and books, and listening to strong communicators. Okay, he has a team of eight men helping him write sermons. There's your problem at least part of it. Ed Linton is not writing his own sermons. He has a team of eight men, at least they're men, but eight men that help him write his sermons, who uh, look at the languages and consult commentaries and reference books and all this kind of stuff. And I am sure that Ed Linton has some input, but if, if you're one of a team of eight, and I don't know, maybe he's the ninth, but whatever. If if you're only if you're one of a team of eight uh that that is doing sermon preparation week in and week out, then you're not writing your own sermons. You're not doing your own study. Others are doing it for you. That's a problem. I have a number of friends who are pastors and I've talked to several of them in the last couple of days since this really blew up. And I asked them, I already knew the answer, but I asked them anyway, just to go on the record. Um, how many, how many people do you have help you writing? How many people help you write your sermons? And to a man, they've said one, one, they write their own sermons. And friends, that's the way it ought to be done. When I write a sermon, I'm the one who writes it. Uh, now, there is nothing at all wrong with consulting commentaries or language helps or reference materials or reading books or that kind of thing. And, and maybe, maybe for example, you've, you're using something for an illustration. Maybe it's a historical example and you know some, you've got a history buff in your church and you say, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, do I have this right about the, you know, the Battle of the Bulge or Gettysburg or whatever, you know, and seeking someone who's an expertise in a particular field that you might be using as an illustration or something like that, that's perfectly fine. Nothing, you know, no harm, no foul, no, nothing wrong with that. But you ought to be writing your own sermon. You ought to be doing your own study. Scripture tells us that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We are to do our own study. Now, perfectly fine to, to go to someone that you know is a, a well-versed in scripture and say, hey, you know, this is the text I'm dealing with. This is my understanding of it. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you know, do you think I'm, I've got this right? Do you see any problems with this? Or, you know, perfectly fine to, to do that from time to time. And and I've done that from time to time. Hey, you know, this is my understanding of the text. You know, am I out in left field here? But I write my own sermons. Every pastor friend I have writes his own sermons. And so if you've got a team of eight men helping you write your sermons, you're not the one that's doing the heavy lifting in sermon preparation. That's a problem. And you know, it's um, Ed Litton is not the only one that uh, does this. I, I know of some other big name preachers of large churches, and I've talked to some people who used to be in these churches, work for them, work for the particular pastor, uh, two big names, and if I named them, you would, you would recognize them, um, that have teams of people, teams of men, maybe women too, I don't know, but help them with their sermon, teams that help them with their sermon. That's a problem. That's an integrity issue. Uh, I want to know, and by the way, I, I know from firsthand that John MacArthur writes his own sermon. So when I say big name, I'm not including John MacArthur, but more of the uh, kind of seeker-oriented type churches, pastors. But anyway, when I'm in church and I, I'm sitting in the pew and I'm watching the pastor preach and teach, I want to know that that man has spent hours and hours and hours studying the scriptures on his own that his that he has studied to show himself approved that 
that he need not be ashamed, that this man has uh, saturated his mind with the text, studied it, um, outlined it, and got to the meaning of the text, and that this this meaning, this text, has impacted him and is shaping his thinking. So I, I don't want to hear from a man who has a whole team of people helping him write his sermons. That's a problem. So even in his apology, there's a there's a huge, huge issue here. Well, he's very busy. Well, he's got a big church. He's got a lot of demands on his time. As a pastor, your number one job is to shepherd the flock, feeding the flock. And you can't teach what you do not know. You should not be preaching to others any kind of truth that you have not arrived at from your own diligent study. And this study has impacted you, impacted your life, impacted your mind, filled your heart with the appreciation and awe of who God is. Anyone can take material that's been compiled for him and get up on a Sunday morning and, and deliver it. You know, you could, you could get you get Tom Cruise to do that. You can get an actor to do that. I want to know that my pastor has been in the Word and studied to show himself approved. And that's that's not what is being described here. I was actually shocked that he, he admitted to this. Lytton continues, In that process, I learned about my friend J.D. Greer's messages on Romans and discovered what he had recently preached resonated with the direction God was leading me and our preaching team. Please do not blame God, even in an indirect way, for your plagiarism. God was not leading you in this direction, Mr. Litton, nor was he leading J.D. Greer in the direction, as we shall see, because the, the theology in these sermons was so bad. So bad. Don't, don't blame God for this. Lytton continues, I found that J.D. Greer's message on Romans 1 was insightful, particularly his three points of application. With his permission, I borrowed some of his insights in those three closing points. The story of Paul David Tripp was from his devotional New Morning Mercies on January 22nd. His story took place in India. Um, I'm sure it did because that's exactly what I saw in India as well. But the point here is that... Uh, Linton says that this is really okay because he had J.D. Greer's permission. Even if he did have J.D. Greer's permission, and I'm sure that he did, that does not excuse him. That does not get him off the hook in any way because he went in front of his entire congregation and he preached that message as though it was his own, as though it came from his diligent study, and it did not. In fact... According to what Lytton admits, none of his sermons come purely from his own diligent study because he's got a team of eight, eight men that help him write sermons. So uh, he, he's not off the hook. Lytton goes on to say, next paragraph here, Our team also, with his permission, used the Summit Church's chapter and verse breakdown of Romans as we mapped out our entire series. Now watch this. Out of a commitment to full transparency, I have gone back through all the 46 sermons in this series. Okay, the very fact that he has gone back and removed 46 of the sermons from his Roman series, 37 of which I am in possession, but the very fact that he's gone and taken those down shows you that he knows there's a problem. He knows that there's a problem with far more than this just one individual sermon. In fact, as of this recording, and I'm recording this segment, do this over a couple of days, uh, on the evening of June 27th, Sunday evening, uh, he has removed, either removed, deleted, uh, privatized, hidden, so only people with you know a pass a link or whatever can get into it, but 143, 143 of his sermons have now disappeared from Redemption Church's YouTube channel. What does that tell you? You know, I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt, but for the life of me, I cannot imagine a reason, any other reason other than this issue at hand, this plagiarism, of, of, what would motivate him to remove 143 sermons? And there may be more to come. Who knows? Lytton continues, 
I hold to the same study process on each sermon. So there you go. By his own admission, this eight-member team helps him construct all of his sermons. All of them. He does it for each sermon. As any pastor who preaches regularly knows, we often rely on scholars and fellow pastors to help us think and communicate more clearly with the goal of faithfully preaching the truths of Scripture to our congregations. Yes, we rely on other, what other men have said, other faithful, uh, faithful preachers who have studied, who have studied to show themselves approved. Yes, we can consult these men. We can consult the, uh, the the faithful men who have gone before us and some of our faithful contemporaries. Yes, that's fine. That's part of studying. But we don't get those men to write our sermons for us. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference. But I am sorry for not mentioning J.D.'s generosity in ownership of these points. I should have given him credit as I shared these insights. Yeah, I, that's his apology. And, and this, is, this is what I see a lot of the more moderate, which is just a code word for liberal, but uh, moderate people in the SBC saying, more the social justice guys and gals are saying, oh, Ed Linton has apologized and he's put this to rest. He has only apologized for not mentioning J.D. Greer in the ownership of these points in this one particular sermon. What about the other 143 that have been removed? In fact, um, I, this is Sunday, and uh, after I got home from church, started working on this video again, I was curious to see if Ed Litton had mentioned this controversy in his morning message. So um, they had the the live stream already posted on YouTube, and so I, I went to YouTube and I listened to his sermon, and I want you to hear this. Has anyone in your family, when you came to faith in Christ, accused you of Jesus being a crutch? I'm going to tell you what I told someone who did that to me. I said, he's not my crutch. He is my iron lung. He is my heart. He is my very being. Now, again, I was watching this sermon just because I wanted to see if Ed Litton was going to address the plagiarism controversy. And, but when I heard him say that, I thought, you know, that's an interesting phrase there. I've never heard that before. You know, Jesus is not my crutch. He's my iron lung. That's, that's pretty catchy. And uh, so I thought, you know, I, I'm going to Google that. And so I did Google it. And the first thing that comes up is this quote from Nancy Hicks. Now, I'm not familiar with Nancy Hicks and never had uh, come across her until today, but she is apparently a Christian uh, speaker, author. She goes around apparently on, on uh, kind of like a speaking circuit of sorts. And I, I don't know much about her, but uh, just looking around her website, she she has been featured on Jesus Calling, which that's, that's if you've heard me talk about Jesus calling, you know how I feel about that. And then I took this screenshot that's also on her website, and she takes Acts 28, 31, which is talking about the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel, and she insert she inserts she in there, and uh which that, that just rubs me the wrong way. But anyway, um it turns out this phrase, Jesus is not my crutch, he's my iron lung. This is a line in her book entitled Meant to Live. And uh, she says, I, I downloaded this, this is Kindle version, but she says, uh, they're not worried about being told that Jesus is their crutch. Crutch nothing. They think he's my iron lung. So friends, you know, I, I'm sorry. This is just, it's, it's too close. Uh, I suppose it might be possible that Ed Litton came up with this on his own, and he really did tell someone, as he said, that he himself told someone. Has anyone in your family, when you came to faith in Christ, accused you of Jesus being a crutch? I'm going to tell you what I told someone who did that to me. I said, he's not my crutch. He is my iron lung. He so, Mr. Litton, did you yourself tell someone personally that Jesus is not your crutch, he's your iron lung? Or did you or one of your eight team members who helped you write this sermon read that in Nancy Hicks' book? Dear friends, plagiarism is serious. It is 
theft. It is dishonoring to the people to whom you are preaching. It is ultimately dishonoring to God. And it is very serious. And it wasn't too long ago that if a pastor was caught in this kind of plagiarism, he would have been he would have been defrocked. But here's the thing. It <laughs> I I hesitate to say it's hard to come down too hard on on Ed Litton because it is very serious. But here's the thing. The, the fact of the matter is, is that the Southern Baptist Convention has had a culture of plagiarism for decades. Rick Warren, as one prime example, has encouraged pastors to download his own sermons for a fee, but to download his own sermons and preach them as though they were their own. Uh, he's encouraged pastors to do that. I have sat in churches, my wife and I, shortly before we got married, we went to a church in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and uh, we sat in that service. And And the pastor got up and, and preached. And as he was preaching, I, I was thinking to myself, I've heard this before. I've heard it before. And and so uh even though this was 11 years ago, we still had still had Google back then. And so sure enough, his sermon was word practically word for word, the entire thing, illustrations and everything straight from Rick Warren, straight from his purpose-driven church. Um it's a Rick Warren sermon. He never gave credit to Rick Warren. But friends, the SBC has remained silent on this. The, everybody knows, everybody in the SBC knows that this has been going on with Rick Warren for many, many years, a couple of decades at least, and um, nobody says anything about it. Plagiarism is nothing new. In fact, we can trace it back all the way to the Old Testament. I want to read to you a verse from Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 30. This is God speaking. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. That's what's going on today. Preachers today are stealing words from one another. And it does not matter if you get the permission of the one from whom you are stealing. If you do not give credit to that person, when you get up before your flock, uh, you are, I'm not going to call it misleading. You're lying to your flock. You're presenting that material as your own when it's not your own and you know it's not your own. So stealing words from one another, this goes all the way back to Jeremiah. Uh, in fact, I would encourage you to read Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning, beginning, I believe it's in verse nine. And God gives an absolute blistering denunciation of false prophets. I mean, a blistering denunciation of them. And one of the things that false prophets do is they steal words from one another. And that's what's going on today. Now, uh, I want to return to J.D. Greer in the statement that he released on June 26. J.D. Greer goes on to say, much has also been made of my statement that we should whisper about what the Bible whispers about and shout about what it shouts about. I cited Jen Wilkin in that statement and noted that she was one of our favorite Bible teachers. She was quoting from the late R.C. Sproul in his book, What's in the Bible, co-authored by Robert Wagamuth in their chapter on creation. I applied that quote to the difference in the emphasis Jesus places on the dangers of pride and greed versus sexual sin and said that given the sheer number of times Jesus talks about pride and greed, it has is, it has as if he saved most of his volume to warn about pride and greed. Thus, I said, we should look more fearfully at our own prideful, greedy hearts than we do haughtily at the sexual dysfunction of others. Okay, we'll pause there and come back to it in just a second. So, J.D. Greer was citing Jen Wilkin, and Jen Wilkin was citing quoting R.C. Sproul, and it is indeed a quote from R.C. Sproul in his book, What's in the Bible? But friends, I have that book. And R.C. Sproul's quote about, we should not shout about what the Bible whispers about, that has absolutely nothing 
to do with sexual sin. It was indeed in his chapter on creation. Now, I want to show you exactly where this comes from. This is the uh, Kindle version of what's in the Bible. And there in the left-hand column, you see Sproul talking about the six days of creation. He says, were the six days of creation a form of poetry and symbolism, or were they literally 24-hour days? I find that it is always dangerous to shout where God has whispered. So Sprawl is not talking about sexual sin here. He's talking about the days in Genesis. Were these literal 24-hour periods, or were they... It was it some kind of poetry that represents a much longer period of time. Now, this book was first published in 2003. So uh, I want to show you and affirm in defense of Sproul, who can no longer defend himself because he is with Christ, that Sproul very much was a young earth creationist who believed in a literal interpretation of Genesis. He came to that a bit later, but this is from uh, Ligonier's website. This is a Q&A that was posted in 2011. So the question is, what is R.C. Sproul's position on creation? And show you a screenshot from this article. Sproul writes, For most of my teaching career, I considered the framework hypothesis to be a possibility, but I have now changed my mind. I now hold to, hold to a literal six-day creation, the fourth alternative and the traditional one. Now, what he means by the fourth alternative, earlier in the article, he lays out four possibilities or theories. The gap theory, the day-age theory, the framework hypothesis, and then finally the fourth, and that is the six-day, 24-hour period. And so that's what he means. According to the Reformation hermeneutic, the first option is to follow the plain sense of the text. One must do a great deal of hermeneutical gymnastics to escape the plain meaning of Genesis 1 through 2. The confession makes it a point of faith that God created the world in the space of six days. Indeed, you have to do a lot of hermeneutical gymnastics to get around the plain reading and plain meaning of Genesis 1 through 2. And so uh, earlier, Sproul apparently was not real settled on uh, how to read Genesis 1 through 2. But he later came to the right understanding. And so that it's really unfortunate that J.D. Greer would use that quote from Sproul in, in his statement that he put up uh, and connect it to creation, just kind of leave it there as though Sproul never was settled on how to read Genesis 1 and 2. Well, he was. This, this was posted in 2011. And so Sproul is no longer here to defend himself. He is with Christ. I envy him. Uh, so I figured I would go to bat for R.C. Sproul. Yes, he did believe in a literal reading of Genesis 1 through 2. God created in six 24-hour periods. And there's one other place in the book that R.C. Sproul talks about shouting and whispering. Uh, there in the right-hand column, Sproul says, as I said in the first chapter regarding the how of creation, I have believed that a Bible student should be careful not to shout when God whispers. And he says, as it concerns many of the issues regarding the end times, God chose to be sparing in his disclosures to whisper. So this is the other place in the book, the only other place in the book where um, Sproul uses this motif of shouting and whispering, and he used it in reference to eschatology, referring to the different views of the end times, amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, and, and there's different subdivisions within each of those. So uh, Sproul is simply saying, yeah, you can have your view, but don't be too dogmatic about it. You know, don't break fellowship over it. So the shouting and whispering quote from R.C. Sproul has nothing to do with sexuality, much less homosexuality. R.C. Sproul was crystal clear on what the Bible has to say about sexual sin, including homosexual sin. This was not something that R.C. Sproul believed that the Bible whispered about. And it is really, really unfortunate and really disappointing that the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, J.D. Greer, 
would take that quote from R.C. Sproul that has nothing to do with sexuality and apply it to that. Really unfortunate, and it's intellectually dishonest to do it. Okay, dear ones, so now I want to move into the theology of these respective sermons. And uh, I will affirm, and I, I want to be fair to these guys. I'm not trying to take anybody out of context here, or put words in their mouth, or you know, selectively cut things to make you know portray them in, in the worst possible way. I, I don't want to do that. Uh, I will affirm that both Greer and Lytton affirmed that homosexuality is sinful. They did. Uh, and Lytton especially even quoted 1 Corinthians 6, and he said if you, if you practice these things, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor revilers, drunkards, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Lytton quoted that verse, and uh, he said if you practice these things, homosexuality included, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, to his credit. So it, it's not that they said homosexuality was not sinful. In fact, I'm going to put the links to these sermons below in the dis in the description. Well, I guess I can only put the link to, to Greer's sermon because Lytton's sermon has been removed. But I'll put the link to Greer's sermon down there and, and watch it. I would encourage you to do that and, and judge for yourself. So it's not that they said it's not sinful. They did. It's just that they diminished the sexual sin. Now, I, I want to show you a clip of something that didn't really get any attention, but I think it absolutely should have. And interestingly, it's yet another example of plagiarism. But watch this from first from J.D. Greer and then from Ed Litton. In fact, let me say something here that I fear might get misunderstood, but I feel like it's important enough that even though I might get misunderstood, I'm going to say it anyway. In this sense, you can almost think of homosexuality as an affliction and not just a sinful choice. Because for most gay people, they feel like they didn't choose those desires. In fact, here's what I've learned after two decades of pastoring. Almost every person I've encountered, in the church at least, almost every person who struggles with the same sex attraction is almost always dealing first and foremost with an unanswered prayer. You and I may think that homosexuality is a sinful choice, and I have actually said that from this pulpit. But many gay people that I know don't think they've ever chosen this desire. And in a real sense, they may be right. They are right. And it isn't because their desires are God-given. Their desires, like mine, are sin-given. Sin is an affront to a holy God. And every person I know who struggles with same-sex attraction has an unanswered prayer in their life. I'm talking about the people who struggle with it. And the unanswered prayer is, God, why didn't you take this away from me? Okay, I am not at all comfortable with what you just heard, what we just heard. First, J.D. Greer says that you can think of homosexuality, almost think of it not as a, a sinful choice, but rather as an affliction. No. My cerebral palsy is an affliction. Multiple sclerosis is an affliction. Muscular dystrophy, cancer, arthritis, Lou Gehrig's disease. These things are afflictions. They are not choices. And so for him to say that, I, I think, is, is very dangerous and disingenuous. And, and then he says that uh, it's, it's a result of unanswered prayer. Both Greer and Lytton said that, that it's, it's a result of unanswered prayer. That comes perilously close to the line, if not crossing the line of even in an indirect way like this was, to blame God for your homosexual desires. Oh, well, if God had just answered my prayer, then these things would have been taken away. And so you're really laying the blame at God's feet. That's bad. That, that, that is bad. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The one who, who the sun sets free is free indeed. We are new creatures in Christ. Old things passed away, behold, all things are made new. So uh, don't even in an indirect way even begin to, to, to blame God for your sinful desires. Um, can someone who is regenerate still have sinful desires? Uh, 
Yes, we can, but we are also indwelt by the third person of the triune Godhead, and we are to put to death the deeds of the body, Romans 8.13. We are to take every thought captive, per 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. We are to do these things, go to war with our flesh, as a matter of uh, part of our progressive personal sanctification. And so you can't just say, oh, well, I've prayed for God to take this way and he hasn't, so you know I'm, I'm stuck with it. No, go to war. Go to war with your flesh. Uh, yes, cre uh, new Christians or, or new creatures in Christ, believers, yes, we still struggle with temptation, but we are also indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the fellowship of the saints. We have the, we have the, the local body of believers and all these things God uses in our progressive sanctification. And we are to take these thoughts captive and go to war with our flesh. If you have been saved out of alcoholism, don't go hang out at a bar to do your witnessing. You know, I mean, take some common sense orders and go to war with your flesh. So uh, I, I'm really not comfortable with what we just heard from Greer or from Lytton and, of course, plagiarism. And one of the points that Greer and Lytton both made over and over and over, they really belabored this throughout their sermons, is that homosexuality, yes, it is sinful, but it's no more sinful than any other sin. It's just one sin of among many. And so we should not place more emphasis on homosexuality than any, than any other sin. And so uh, I'm, I'm going some, this is leading to the shouting, whispering thing. So I just want to lay a little groundwork um, Watch this. In one sense, we shouldn't be surprised that this is where Paul turns first. Paul is not picking on homosexuality. He is not saying that it is a worse sin than all the other sins. It's just that if God made us in his image, male and female, then it shouldn't surprise us that the effects of our rejection of God in the center of our life would show up in those primary relationships. Paul cites homosexuality, one scholar says, not because it is a greater sin than any other, but because it is the clearest evidence of a rejection of God's order in creation. Now, again, it is important to realize that Paul is not just randomly picking on homosexuality here. He's just citing it as one of the clearest examples of elevating our desires over the creator's design. We're in a situation in which we say, it's not about what the creator wants. It's not about the creator's design, it's about what I want. Homosexuality is just one, one example though. And so Paul goes on to mention the other ways that our idolatry, the other ways that our prioritizing of our desires over the creator's de design, other ways that we see creation unravel. All of us in some way have experienced corrupted sexual desire, but the point is that the central sin is the same. We rejected God's rule and substituted our own in its place. That manifests in different people differently and we don't get to choose our corruption. And I wanna make something very plain. We are not evolving in our views on the subject of this homosexuality. What we are doing is seeking biblical clarity. Nor does it make same-sex attraction more sinful than greed. And so both Lytton and Greer go out of their way to talk about how Yes, homosexuality is sinful, but it's not more sinful than any of the other sins like gossip and greed and all these other things. So yeah, it's sinful, but not more sinful than any other sin. And in a sense, yes, they are, they are right. James 2.10, uh, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point is guilty of all. So yes, if you break even one of God's laws one time, then that is more than enough to condemn you to an eternity in hell. That is true. However, different sins do have different consequences. If I were to, uh, if I were to murder someone in cold blood, the consequences of that, at least in a temporal sense, uh, would be more significant to me than if I were to, you know, steal a pencil off of someone's desk at the office or something like that. So. Uh, different sins do have different temporal consequences, but yes, in, in God's in, in God's judicial economy, yes, if you break one of God's laws, you've broken them all. That is true. But they present all of this in a very unbiblical way. Watch this, and what you're about to see, this was actually, this was stunning to me. Watch this. Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. 
Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. That is one of the most logically fallacious and theologically inept statements I have ever heard in my life. That, that, when I heard both Greer and Lytton say that, I could hardly believe what I was hearing. Now, let me break this down a little bit. A person is not lost because he is a homosexual. He's a homosexual because he is lost. Okay, And so I share the gospel the same way with a homosexual that I share the gospel with anyone. I just share the gospel. And I get that person to understand that he's a liar, he's a thief, he's a blasphemer, he's an adulterer at heart, he's an idolater, he's got all these other sins. And I share the gospel the same way because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. To say that homosexuality will not send you to hell because heterosexuality will not send you to heaven is is careless and sloppy at best. Now, what I mean by that is this. If if a person if a person's only sin was being a homosexual, if that's the only other sin that that person had ever committed, which is an absurdity and never would never happen, but let's just for kicks and giggles. If let's say a person whose only sin that he or she has ever committed in his entire life is being a homosexual, that sin would absolutely condemn that person to hell. But here's the thing, is that every single homosexual is also what you and I are. Every single homosexual is also a liar, is also a thief, has also taken God's name in vain and word and deed, is a, a blasphemer. They are adulterers at heart at least. Uh, so they have committed all these other sins. So when I'm witnessing a homosexual, I don't have to drill down on homosexuality. I give that person the gospel. And if, if God calls that person salvifically to himself, then that person will be delivered uh, from the sin of homosexuality. To say that and draw an equivalency and say that, you know how I know that? Because heterosexuality will not send you to heaven. That is a mind-numbingly dumb, theologically speaking, thing to say. Heterosexuality is not inher inherently sinful. That's God's design. Okay, It's not inherently sinful for a man to be attracted to a woman or for a woman to be attracted to a man, or let's just say generally speaking, men to women and women to men. That's not inherently sinful. That's God's design. If men were not attracted to women and women were not attracted to men, nobody would ever get married and there wouldn't be any way to repopulate the earth once you know generations die out. So that's God's design. Heterosexuality is good. That's God's design. Homosexuality is not good. That's not God's design. Adam and Eve were attracted to one another before the fall. Heterosexual, good. Homosexuality came in after the fall. That is an innately disordered and sinful, inherently sinful desire. So to, to, to somehow draw an equivalency between these two things and, and make that analogy, that is just, honestly, I could not believe that, the, that anyone who would say that would that these men are pastors, much less presidents of the SBC. But that just laid the groundwork for this. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference, she said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. So let me get this straight. They've spent all this time telling us how, yes, homosexuality is a sin, but it's no worse than any other sin. You know, all sins are the same. But the Bible apparently just whispers about sexual sin when it shouts about materialism and pride and greed. Am I getting that about right? 
so all sins are equal. No sin's worse than the other. But the Bible shouts about materialism, pride, and greed. So which is it? Are, are they all equal? Are they all the same? Or are materialism, pride, and greed taken more seriously by God in his word than the other sins? You can't have it both ways. Logically, that is just an absolutely untenable position. But the very notion that a pastor would even entertain the idea that the Bible and God, obviously, whispers about sexual sin, that is absolutely gobsmacking to me. Let's take a, a quick stroll through just a few of these verses. Colossians 3, 5 through 6. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Hmm. Sexual immorality and greed listed in the exact same verse. So I guess the Bible whispers about sexual immorality, but it shouts about greed, even though they're in the, literally in the same breath. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Doesn't sound like a whisper to me. Romans 13, 13. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10. Knowing this, that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and godless, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral persons, for homosexuals, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Does that sound like a whisper to you? It doesn't sound like a whisper to me either. Ask David if God whispers about sexual sin. Read Psalm chapter 51. Read that. Read his lament and ask yourself, would David think that God whispers about sexual sin? Ask the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah if God whispers about sexual sin, specifically homosexual sin. Ask those folks as God rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed those cities because of homosexuality. Ask them if you think that was like a whisper. Absolutely unbelievable to me that a pastor would even entertain such a notion that the Bible whispers about sexual sin. Read Proverbs chapter 5. Take a stroll through Proverbs chapter 5. Take a stroll through Proverbs chapter 6 and see if you think that sounds like a whisper. In fact, I want to read, I want to read this to you. Proverbs chapter 6. Let's look at verses 27 through 29 and then 32 through 33. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. Does that sound like a whisper? If you want to destroy yourself, commit sexual sin and you will be on the fast track to self-destruction. Wounds and disgrace you will find, and your reproach will not be blotted out. Now, is that saying that if you commit sexual sin that there is no forgiveness for you and you're just condemned to an eternity in hell? No. Sexual sin can be forgiven just as any other sin can be forgiven. God expects bends no more anthropomorphic energy 
to forgive someone of sexual sin than he does to forgive someone from for being a murderer okay so that's not the point the point though is this what what Proverbs 6 is saying your reproach will not be blotted out there is something about sexual sin that is different than all the other sins in fact Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 1 Corinthians 6 18 flee sexual immorality every other sin that a man commits is outside the body but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body Paul says to flee this sin don't play with it don't dabble it with it don't uh, keep it at arm's length don't entertain it in any way flee from it flee why because sexual sin is committed inside the body unlike other sins that are committed uh, externally to the body sexual sin is internal and even though you can be forgiven of it judicially through the merits of Jesus Christ it will leave a stain it will leave a reproach that will never be fully blotted out the passage of time over years yes can th those those stains can be lessened but you know what there's always going to be a wound there's always going to be a scar because sexual sin is committed inside the body and even though we can be forgiven of that judicially speaking forgiven of that through Christ completely and totally there's going to leave a there's going to be a wound there's going to be a scar there that will never fully go away uh, when I was um, of course I was born with cerebral palsy I've had a number of operations and the first operations that I had, I had as a toddler. I was two, two and a half years old, down on my legs. And uh, you know what? I am 48 years old now, and I can look down on my legs, and I can still see those scars from those operations that I had when I was a, a toddler. They're faded. They're, they're not nearly as big and nearly as bright as they used to be. But there's still a wound there's still a scar there and in much the same way when you sin sexually it's going to leave a wound even though judicially completely forgiven it's going to leave a wound flee flee sexual immorality it is mind-boggling to me that a pastor could could possibly say that the bible just whispers about sexual sin I mean, these, these men are pastors. Have, have they not counseled husbands and wives who have sinned against each other in that way and it has destroyed their marriages? How many homes have been wrecked by sexual sin? How many, how many children have seen their parents divorce because of sexual sin? And apparently the Bible just whispers about it? It's, it's unbelievable to me. And Ed Litton preached his sermon a full year after J.D. Greer preached his. He had a whole year to think about this. And when J.D. Greer first preached his sermon, it caused quite the dust up, rightfully so. And uh, men like Tom Askell and Josh Bice and Tom Buck and others, rightfully so, made an issue out of this. They should have. They were right to do it. And so a full year later... Ed Litton preaches it again. It's just unbelievable to me. I'm, I'm sorry. I keep. I just find myself absolutely incredulous that this could happen. In fact, Ed Litton's sermon that he preached back in 2020 has been up on his YouTube channel for a year and a half until he finally took it down just a couple of days ago because all this controversy about the plagiarism. That's the only reason it was taken down. Every you know, I, I, as my mind just swims when I think about this. And I think I, I put myself in the, in the shoes of someone who is there in the pew or in the stadium seating or whatever they got in their church. And they're, they're listening to their pastor, Ed Litton, say that the Bible and God whispers about sexual sin. If I had been there, it would have been all I could have done to stay in my seat when I heard that. I mean, every 
person who had been saved more than about 15 minutes in that church should have been lined up outside of his office door saying, what did you mean by that? What, what are you talking about? Unbelievable. I'm just, just absolutely unbelievable. Friends, the Bible whispers about no sin. The Bible whispers about no sin. The Bible does not whisper about sexual immorality. It does not whisper about lying. It does not whisper about stealing. It whispers about no sin. It's just unreal to me. And that is a sad state of affairs. It is a sad commentary on the, on the spiritual health of the SBC that this could go unchallenged for so long. And these two men who are pastors and indeed current president and immediately you know, preceding former president of the SBC could, could teach such things. Just unreal. Dear ones, uh, the Bible whispers about no sin. Okay, dear ones, I want to conclude this video just by presenting the gospel. The bad news is that you are a sinner and God's wrath burns against your sin. All of us have sinned. The Bible says, Thou shalt not lie. Each and every one of us has told lies. Thou shalt not steal. If you have ever taken anything that does not belong to you, you are a thief. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, but Jesus says, If you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. If you have ever looked at another person with lust, then you are an adulterer. And all of us have broken God's laws thousands of times throughout the courses of our lives. We have blasphemed the name of God. We have taken his name in vain in word and deed. We have broken his laws thousands of times. And just like when we break laws here on earth, there's a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of God? But because we have sinned against God who is eternal, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell, where the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched, there will be wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth. People in hell will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The full, undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on the ungodly for all of eternity and there will be no rest. That's the bad news. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what our sins have earned us. And there's even more bad news. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Our works profit us nothing. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament says that our works are as filthy rags before a thrice holy God. There is there is nothing that we can do to earn our favor with God. There's nothing we can do to earn our place into heaven. So we are sinners deserving of the full wrath of God, and there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. That's very, very bad news. But there is good news. And the good news of the gospel is this, is that God has made a way for you to escape his wrath. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus lived a perfect life, fully God, fully man. Jesus was pre-existent, pre co-eternal with the Father from eternity past. Jesus was not created. That's, that's what the cults believe. He was not created. But Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth and took on a human nature. And so when Jesus was on this earth... He was, he was one person with two natures, the God-man. And Jesus lived a perfect life on this earth. He, he never broke any of God's laws. He was the lamb without blemish. And Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. His life was not taken. He gave it. And this perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. Jesus died on the cross, satisfying God's wrath. 
And then three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And the only way to be saved, the only way to have the wrath of God removed is to repent of sin, turn from sin, and place your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And I want to say something about repentance. Because a lot of people think, a lot of church people think, oh, repent just means to change your mind. That's what the Greek word metanoia, the word for repent, metanoia means. And yes, it does mean, the word in its etymology does mean just to change your mind. But biblical repentance is far more than that. The word may mean to change your mind, but biblical repentance comes when God grants it. You see, genuine repentance is not something that you and I can do on our own. We can't do it because we're dead in trespasses and sins. Genuine repentance comes when God grants repentance. And when God grants repentance to us, yes, our minds are changed, but everything about us is changed. Our desires are changed. Our affections are changed. Why? Because our heart has been changed. The Bible talks about how before we come to Christ, we're dead in trespasses and sins. We have a heart of stone. But when we come to Christ, He takes that heart of stone out and replaces it with a heart of flesh. We've been made alive in Christ. And one of the surest ways to know if you have truly repented of your sin is to examine yourself, as Paul says to do in 2 Corinthians 13, and see if you have either a worldly sorrow or a godly sorrow over sin. The Bible speaks of both of these in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And let me help you understand what that means because the difference between a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow over sin is literally the difference between heaven and hell. A worldly sorrow, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, leads to death, eternal death. A godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. So what's the difference? A worldly sorrow is nothing more than a guilty conscience. A worldly sorrow over sin says this, what would happen to me if my sin were exposed? What would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin, not because we grieve over our sin, but because we don't want the consequences of our sin. What would happen to me if my sin were exposed? Whatever that sin is. What would happen to me? What would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin. Not because we grieve over it, but because we don't want the consequences of it. So whether it's lying, whether it's stealing, whether it's plagiarizing, whether it's what we look at on the computer when no one's around looking, we don't grieve over that. We try to cover it up. And so... If you just want to cover up your sin because you don't want the consequences of it, that's a worldly sorrow. And Paul says a worldly sorrow leads to death. A worldly sorrow is when we, if we could get away with our sin, you see, if nobody would know about it, if nobody would know what we're doing on the side, if nobody would know what we're looking at on the computer, on the TV or whatever, if nobody would know what I'm doing, you know, out when I tell my wife I'm going to, you know, go fishing with the fellows, but I'm really going somewhere else. If nobody would know about these things, if we could get away with it, you see, we would run right back to it. That is a telltale sign of a worldly sorrow that leads to death. But there's another kind of sorrow over sin, and that is a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow over sin comes when we grieve over our sin. We grieve over our sin because we understand our sin grieves God. And we do not want to grieve Him. He has been so good, so kind, so generous, so patient with us. And yet we sin against Him and that grieves us. A godly sorrow is that sorrow that is vertically oriented. A godly sorrow is that sorrow that David had. I mentioned a little while ago in this video the sorrow that David had in Psalm chapter 51 when he cried out to God. He said, against you and you alone, O Lord, O Yahweh, have I sinned. My sin is ever before me. We grieve over our sin. That is a godly sorrow. And a godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. 
It is good and it is right to warn people to flee from the wrath to come. It's good and it's right to warn people to flee from hell. But just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, we should want a Savior from sin. A lot of people out there want a Savior from hell. They want to get out of hell free card because they're their, their conscience convicts them, and deep down they know that that's what they deserve. And so they want to get out of that. There's a lot of people who want that, but there's not nearly as many people who want a Savior from sin. If you want a Savior from hell, but not a Savior from sin, then, dear friend, you have a Savior from neither. Just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, we should want a Savior from our sin. And this is not to say that a Christian cannot sin. Christians can and do sin. But here's the thing. Christians stumble into sin. Christians don't swim in it. If you're a Christian, if you're a new creature in Christ, then you have a new heart with new affections and new desires. And yeah, you may stumble into sin, but you don't relish it. You don't look for opportunities to sin. You don't plan your sin out. You don't... You, you, when you sin, it grieves you. Does your sin grieve you? Do you have that godly sorrow over sin? Do you have a desire to read and study Scripture? Do you have a love for Christ? Do you have a love for His Word? Do you, do you desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Apostle Peter says? Do you, do you desire fellowship with the saints, fellowship with other Christians, you have a love for the brethren. These are all fruits in keeping with repentance. And so if you're not sure of where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to get real honest before Him. Confess your sins to Him. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to grant you forgiveness. Repentance from your sin. And if you come to Christ in a true godly sorrow over sin, I promise you, He will save you. He will take out that heart of stone, put in that heart of flesh. You will pass from death to life. You will be made alive in Christ. You will be a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things will be made new. He will not cast you aside. Come to Christ. Turn from sin. Repent of sin and place your trust in Him. And that is the good news of the gospel. And Jesus is our reward. He is our reward. He is who makes heaven, heaven. And maybe you're watching this and you are in some kind of sexual sin. Maybe you're watching this and maybe maybe you're homosexual because you heard something about this video and homosexuality was discussed. And so you're watching this video out of curiosity to see See what I had to, to say about it. If you're watching this and, and you're a homosexual, can I say to you that God can save you just as much and just as quickly as He can save anyone else? I've already read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9-11 through 11, that talks about homosexuals and how they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But neither will drunkards or revilers or swindlers or the covetous. They won't inherit the kingdom of God either. But Paul says something just marvelous. In the very next, in verse 11, Paul says, after he lists all of these horrific sins, in verse 11 he says this, and it's so beautiful. He says, but such were some of you. You were those things. But you're not anymore. You were a reviler, but you're not anymore. You were a drunkard, but you're not anymore. You, you were a fornicator, but you're not anymore. You were a homosexual, but you're not anymore. You were those things, but you've been made a new creature in Christ. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. If you will come to Christ in a godly sorrow over sin, He will save you. You'll be adopted into the family of God through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that is you, if you have heard this gospel and it resonates with you, trust Christ. Come to Him. He'll save you. And what you need to do now is you need to find a good church. And 
most churches out there aren't really churches. Seek out a church that that does. Now, if you're new to all this, you might want to look this word up. But seek out a church that does 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 expository preaching. That's preaching the word of God verse by verse. It is committed to the text of scripture and expository preaching simply means exposing the meaning of the text. That's what you're looking for in a preacher, a preacher, a man who gets up and studies his own sermons, writes his own sermons, spends his own time studying God's word and gets up in the pulpit and he exposes the meaning of God's word to the people listening. Seek out a church that does that. Seek out a church that is led by uh, what the Bible calls a plurality of elders. Uh, Seek out a church that does what is described in Matthew chapter 18, this church discipline. And and I know for the, those of you who are watching and are new to this, these are new terms, but um, I've got resources on my website. Uh, there's other websites that have good resources that can help you understand what these terms are, but, but Google them uh, and, and you'll want to seek out a church that has these things. So um, you, need to, you need the fellowship of the saints. You need to be in a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, Bible practicing church, uh, where you can be led, you can be fed the word of God, you can be shepherded by biblically qualified men, and then uh, you will you will have everything you need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I know this has been a bit of a long video and a bit of a long gospel presentation, but you know what? Sheep want to be fed, and so I just put out the the call of the shepherd, Jesus, and if you're if you're one of his lost sheep, this will resonate with you, and I hope and pray that it does. So, thank you very much for watching this, um, dear ones. Thank you much, and uh, until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.